Hey, this is Jeff. This is Getting Started in the 8-Week Immersion Training, your guide to orientation week. So in this video, we're going to cover the purpose of orientation week. Like, why do we have a whole week just for orienting you to the 8-Week Immersion Training? What happens in orientation week? And then also, what do you do? What to do in orientation week? So this video is really here for you as a bit of its own orientation. It's an orientation in and of itself. And if you watch this before your orientation calls, then fantastic. You'll be more than ready. You'll probably have some questions for me. If you watch this after, that's fantastic as well because it might fill in some of the blanks for you and uh, give you a chance to take some uh, uh, notes that are uh, a little bit more clear for you because I might have just gone a little too fast in our orientation call as well. So let's get into this. So what's the purpose of Orientation Week? Well, I'll give you a little background. When we first started training coaches, when I first started training coaches at JTS Advisors, I created the training really primarily because I had to hire coaches to work for me that were taking on the abundance of clients that I had at the time. And I just wanted the best coaches in the world, so I came up with some uh, very specific uh, processes and methods that would provide that no matter who was coming into the training, no matter what training they had already gotten. Uh, but what I hadn't planned on was having the, uh, the, the easiest transition into coaching. I hadn't planned on creating the most user-friendly environment for these coaches. Uh, I hadn't planned on making this really straightforward and simple. I really didn't care about that stuff because you know these individuals were going to work for me and in a way it was almost like a challenging environment to see who could just handle the challenges I threw at them uh, and uh, and so I really wasn't worried about how clear they were on what was going on I left the clarity you know to, to them for their responsibility and see how they how they did and everybody did okay but we didn't have an orientation week. I mean, I just threw them in and, uh, into the deep end or into the fire on, on week one, uh, gave them the practices, and then there were tons of them, just like we have uh, today even. And, uh, and then it was kind of sink or swim. And we, in fact, when we first did the coaches training, uh, that, that was the beginning of the lineage that has brought us to this point, uh, it was actually a one-month training. It was only four weeks in length. And so if you do your eight-week immersion training now and you're overwhelmed and you're thinking, gosh, there's a lot of assignments and anything like that, just imagine doing the same amount of homework, the same amount of coursework, the same amount of coaching in half the time. <laughs> so we basically killed people at first. But over the years, you know, the first, one of the first changes we made was we doubled the length of it. We made it eight weeks instead of four to make it more livable, uh, especially when we added the strategy and the assessment uh, trainings because those were uh, the uh, the the coursework and the materials were more extensive then so we realized we had to increase the the length of it beyond what uh, even what uh, we felt accountability uh, needed and uh, so we first doubled the length and then uh, after that we started to uh, put together some brief orientation material but we didn't have an orientation week and then finally after having you know eight nine ten trainings where uh, you know, the uh, students were not just complaining, but also kind of overwhelmed in the first couple weeks of not just in getting started, but just feeling like, hey, I'm in this training and I'm working more on trying to figure out what to do next and who to schedule with and what the logistics are. And we're, and our training sessions are filled with logistics. We're doing more of that than we're doing of training. And I don't feel like I'm learning. And so people would be a bit demoralized at the beginning uh, in week one, week two, and by week three, you know, they were really breaking through and they were having great uh, coaching growth and getting great coaching for themselves, but it was a harrowing experience and there were some upsets involved with that as, as well, as you can imagine, because they were feeling, uh, uh, you know, kind of like, well, geez, I'm supposed to be in a training. I'm not getting as much training as I really signed up for, and I'm not learning as much as I think I... Uh, I could if I put all this logistics in the background and didn't have to think about it that much. I wasn't working at it in the middle of the training. And so finally, I, I just said, okay, let's just extricate all of this logistics out of the training completely and make an entire week where all we do is present you the logistics and work through the logistics 
and and just make that the foreground and have you kind of get all that handled and look it's it's never perfect because what we find is no matter how much I give you an orientation week you know we all have a tendency to not only put things off a little bit but not we have a tendency to not really understand it fully until we start doing it you know so still in week one and week two there is a little logistics that, is gonna, that you're gonna be kind of going through and pushing yourself through but it's much less than it ever was uh, before and I think it really makes a difference in the experience of the training uh, itself so that's a little bit of the background of how we got to the point of even creating an orientation week and what's happened in the past coaches trainings and we're continuing to improve and try to make this a little bit more user-friendly experience and uh, and as well uh, a more enriching experience because there's plenty of challenges I don't have to work at making this training more challenging in fact probably the the most of the work is a matter of making it simpler more clear and maybe even a little less challenging not that that's the whole outcome here but uh, when you're learning and you're learning the coach the point is not to to make it hard on you that's not the point of the training at all so get comfortable get the facts that's one of the big purposes here is just so you know what's going on you really start to get comfortable with what we're talking about here because there's a comfort zone there's a comfort level that if you don't reach that it's kinda hard to get in the coaching mode you know or, or let others coach you for that matter and be open about what's going on get to know each other obviously that's another aspect of comfort uh, but you know we wanna we wanna make sure you guys know each other you know when you're in the you're working with uh, each other one-on-one -on -one and in groups etc I want to get to know you myself as well or the the trainers and the mentors are gonna want to get to know you so the get to know each other time that that extra little bit of time we have during orientation week really kinda gives us a chance to get comfortable with each other get to know each other and then in week one we really can hit the ground running rather than just kinda getting to know each other in week one you know so we can put that behind us it's a great and important experience and it's one we don't want again to to clutter up and take all that extra time during week one to review materials there's a lot of materials as you probably already have figured out and uh, you know the the upside of that is that you got everything you need the downside is sometimes it's hard to find it <laughs> sometimes it's hard to find figure out what is for what and so that's a big part of orientation week and then also to sket, set your schedules we're going to talk a lot about that uh, in our video here in just a second so to set up the schedule because you're going to be scheduling all sorts of different calls if you haven't already and you want to be ready for that and you want to know when it is and we want to make sure you can attend everything and make and show up for every call because that's sometimes what it takes to become a master coach is to be on every call that is available and then learn the basic practices there are weekly practices and there are practices at the beginning of the eight week emergent training and uh, those practices you got to learn those uh, in, in order just to move through the training smoothly and again to put the logistics in the background so you can focus on the stuff that's most important which is learning to coach mastering coaching and getting great and fantastic coaching yourself uh, as well so learning those basic practices in orientation week rather than doing it in week one so the point of all of this and again based upon what I've already shared in the history is just one thing it's really just time we're getting, we're, we're, I mean, we're still taking some time to do this during orientation week. In fact, maybe there's a little extra time involved there. But we're really saving a lot of the training time, the most valuable training time that is just so crucial, uh, important, and the most lucrative time that we all have. Uh, the most value I can give you is when I'm training you and coaching and mentoring you uh, from the feedback I've gotten. The most valuable, you, the most value that you can gain and get in the training is when that's happening as well or when you're practicing what you've learned so we want to make sure that we're not having all this stuff cluttering up and taking time in week one through eight basically we want to get that in the background so we can really concentrate put our time and our energy in to what really really matters so we take a little extra time this week to make it uh, easier to do that and uh, and a better and more uh, valuable training overall for you what happens in orientation week really not that much actually so it's it seems like it might be a lot but let's just review number one we're gonna have a general orientation call number two we'll have a preliminary training session so depending on which training session you're a part of you'll be in that it, you'll be in a preliminary version of the normal training session so we schedule you just with your fellow accountability coaches or strategy coaches or assessment coaches 
So you'll have a preliminary, what I like to call prelim, training session for short. You'll get your team assignments, and this is uh, this little graphic here is a picture of the roster that you should be getting access to anytime soon if you haven't already gotten access to it. You'll get your team assignments on this roster. You just check out the roster, and then you know who's on your team, who you're working with, who you're talking to, etc. And then, we already mentioned this before, you're going to schedule the course. Schedule everything in your schedule so you know when you're doing what. That's what happens at Orientation Week. That's pretty much it. The big stuff, at least. So what do you do? Now, here's where you really want to be taking notes. What to do in Orientation Week. Number one, schedule and prepare for your calls. You're going to have a lot of calls next week, or you're going to have a lot of calls in week one, whenever that is. So schedule them. Prepare for them. And we're going to go into detail on what that looks like in just a second. Number two, attend orientation preliminary training sessions. So these are those two big calls that happen during orientation week, the, pre the preliminary training session and then the general orientation. That's very simple. You just got to make sure you show up for those, basically, with your materials if you've got them. Uh, listen to your first CDs. Just uh, It's good to do that during orientation week, so you're prepared for week one and the training session in week one. Read and access your materials. You've really got to get your materials together, and you'll need to read through them and access them. Print them out if you need to print them out. Uh, we'll go into detail on what that looks like in a second. And then finally, record and store key information. And uh, that simply means that there's some key information that you need to get down in your notes or store it on your hard drive or whatever. And that information is really, really key for your participation. And the big, one of the biggest pitfalls, not, okay, I'll correct that. It's not one of the biggest pitfalls, but it is a relatively common pitfall that in week one or two or three, uh, a student says, mm, yeah, I needed this information and I couldn't get it. Please send it to me. And it's because they, they didn't record where to find it because I already gave it to them about three times, right? But uh, at the time, they didn't check it out. They didn't realize it was important, so they just ignored it. Or at the time, they looked at it, checked it out, and they don't know what they did with it. So storing it, kind of filing it away, having the right information in the right context in the right place is really key. Um, one of the things that you learn when you get a PDA or you look at uh, uh, you know, calendar systems and to-do list systems is that and this is kind of a new form of uh, studying, uh, managing time, managing your to-do list and your schedule, is contextual scheduling. It's like, uh, okay, I'm at work, so what are the things that I can get done at work that, are can, uh, that in the context of work makes sense for me to do? Okay, I'm at home, I'm with my wife, what are the things that I should be doing right now that I have on my list of things I want to accomplish with her or with that relationship or, or while I'm around uh, at home, let's say. And these are contexts where there's very specific things to do. Well, the same thing with recording and storing your key information is filing it in the right context. So you'll want to file your support information for calls with the, you know, with everything else that you're going to have for those calls in a file for your calls. So when you bring up, you know, when it's time to make those calls, you've got a file that says calls. I can look in there. I know everything I need for my calls is going to be in that file. It's a context. So that's not necessarily a to-do list for those calls. It could be, but Whatever it happens to be, it's support material for a context. And you've got many different contexts in the training we're going to cover here in just a second. Every one of those contexts have materials and information that's associated with those. You need to kind of tape them all together and sticky note them together or get a file in your computer or a physical file where you put it all in the right place, basically. So uh, record and, st uh, and store key info, very important thing to do during orientation week. So let's cover each one of these. Number one, schedule and prepare for your calls. Schedule and prepare for your calls. So you're going to have four different types of calls any, at any particular week in the eight-week immersion training. You're going to have training sessions, and these are actually done on a conference line. Those are going to be, we'll, we'll talk about those in a second, exactly what they are. You're going to have training sessions every single week of the training. You're going to have coaching team calls pretty much every week of the training. You're going to have coaching partner calls. And then finally, you'll have mentor calls. Those are the four different types of calls. So let's talk about the purpose of the training sessions. First purpose is logistics, just to take care of logistics. We will have that from time to time during almost every training session. Accountability, making sure you're, I'm going to work with you and hold you accountable or you're 
group leader is going to work with you and hold you accountable for the assignments, making sure you follow through on those assignments. There's going to be time during the training sessions for Q&A and coaching. There's also going to be time for practice and feedback. So pr uh, let's cover these just for a second. Q&A and coaching, it's pretty simple. It's like if you need coaching on something you're working on, the homework, or you have a question about some of that stuff, great. It's perfect for the training session. You can ask me or your group leader. Practice and feedback. Some training sessions, there'll be a chance for you to practice the art of that specific type of coaching in my presence or in the presence of uh, your, uh, your master coach group leader. And so you'll get feedback from us uh, after you practice that and feedback from the group as well on what you did well, what could be uh, improved. So those are the purposes of the training sessions, purpose of the coaching team sessions. Now again, these are one-on-one -on -one calls where your training sessions are in a group. The purpose of the coaching team sessions are for practice and feedback because they're going to score you every time you coach them. And you get practice coaching them because it's a real world scenario. You're going to get coaching for you also because sometimes they're going to be coaching you. You'll get coaching on anything that you want coaching on. Purpose of the coaching partner calls. First, accountability. This is a great place to get one-on-one -on -one daily accountability from, uh, from a partner that we're going to assign to you. Support. This is really kind of your best friend in the training also. This is going to be the person that really supports you fully uh, during the training. Make sure that, that you kind of make it through. Logistics. Sometimes your partner just happens to know where the stuff is, or they just happen to know when the next session is. They just happen to know what's going on with that particular week, right? And so sometimes it's just good to ask your partner, since you're talking to them pretty much every day, uh, hey, uh, where's that document for this thing that I need? And they'll get it to you sometimes. Sometimes they know more than you. Sometimes you can help them. So logistics is a big part of your coaching partner, what they can bring to you. Purpose of the mentor. Guidance is a big part of it. They'll be your guide through the training. Coaching for you as well. Again, this is just like your coaching team. It'll be another coach for you in any area of your life that you choose. And then finally, expert practice and feedback because you'll have a chance to actually coach your mentor if uh, you ask them uh, any particular week of the training. You can coach them. They'll give you feedback and maybe even score you using the scoring that we've set up for your particular type of coaching as well. So those are the purposes of these four different types of calls. Now, here's just a simple way to think of each type of call. So training sessions, think of them like Grand Central. Like it's really Grand Central Station. Everything that could be happening in the training could happen there. Uh, it's a center of logistics, a center of accountability, it's a center of the practices that you're doing, and the center of wh where you're learning and, and really getting answers to uh, what you're learning how to do. Coaching team. This is, you think of these guys as paying clients. I mean, they're really just people who are, happen to be your clients, and they happen to be your coaches as well, but the big, the big part that you want to think of them as is a paying client that you're taking care of, somebody that you are really serving as a coach. So treat them as such. Treat them like somebody that you really want to make a difference for them, change their lives, and, and, and give them the best coaching possible. Your coaching partner, think of them as a friend. You know, now they will hold you accountable, hopefully, and, and help you with the logistics as well. But more importantly, they're, they're really kind of the one person in the training that like, they don't have any vested interest in treating you one way or the other or, or uh, training you one way or the other or getting something from you. They're just your partner. That in the training sessions, I mean, there's a little bit of peer pressure there, right? Because we're in a group. In the coaching team, you might be scoring them, but they're also scoring you. So sometimes there's a little bit of sense of like, well, I, I, I better score them a certain way or I, I, I want to treat them a certain way because they might score me badly or well or something. This is not always, it's not always true that that occurs, but, you know, sometimes that's just the way human beings think. You know, I know I've had those types of thoughts before in a situation where there's a reciprocal relationship. And the coaching team, that's, that's a big part of it. It's a big reciprocation when you can get a different score that could really impact and affect um, your uh, training scores, your statistics basically, or theirs for that matter. Uh, in the c with the coaching partner though, it's not like that. They're not going to score you. They're, they really, there's nothing for them to like give you or you to give them that is so crucial. So uh, they really are just your friend. You know, they'll accept you the way you are. You can tell them anything and really it's not going to make any difference uh, in terms of how the training really goes. So they're your number one support your coaching partner is kind of your lifeline.
think of them as a friend. And then finally, your mentor, they're like your guide. Again, I like to use the word Sherpa for this. They're like your Sherpa that's taking you through the wild forest or the mountains of the training, you know, having, helping you to climb the steepest cliffs in the training and getting you past those, getting you to the highest mountaintop in the training as well. Uh, you want to get to the top of the mountain, you're going to have to stretch yourself. You're going to have to climb and take some, uh, take some risk, get out on a ledge every once in a while. And your Sherpa, your mentor, uh, is there to help you with that um, uh, throughout uh, the training. And uh, it's very, very important that you use your mentors in that way because sometimes you just need a guide, somebody who's been there before you, somebody who has uh, gotten through those challenges and done it successfully so you can model them. You can use them as a role model or take, them, take their example and kind of copy it a little bit or just listen to what they say and you know, use it as food for thought, etc. So these are just ways to think of these different types of calls, these different relationships. Now let's get into the training sessions more specifically. So in the training sessions, first of all, put these guys on your schedule, on your calendar. Uh, put these, uh, these training sessions that we're going to schedule. It's gonna, we're going to schedule them during the preliminary training session call. Uh, so you need to bring your calendar to that call. Um, and then once we get these things scheduled, you're j you just got to get them on your calendar so you know where they are and when they are and what time of day and all that stuff. We'll find a time everybody can make. Uh, it's not always the most convenient time, but you will be able to make that time and you will be you know, conscious for it and, and be able to focus 100% on that time. Be flexible. You got to make sure you're flexible in this process because you know it's it's never a perfect time for anybody. But we will accommodate what's 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 a must. And a couple notes. Uh, note any exceptions outside the normal time. Sometimes there's there's one week where somebody's got a flight they've got to make or something like that, and this is impossible for them to be on that normal, consistently scheduled time. So we schedule a little bit different time. If that happens during your prelim call. Be ready for that and make sure you put it on your calendar. Make sure you set up some reminders or some, some way of a buddy system for your buddy to, or your partner or somebody else in the training to remind you, hey, this is a different time this week. Make sure you make it for the correct time because you still need to make it. And you, you got to be responsible for showing up outside the habitual time that we're normally showing up at. You're, you still have to be at those calls. Those are mandatory for you to uh, get certified. And if you're looking to be on my team, you have to show up. There are no exceptions and, uh, and, and no excuses for that. So make sure you note any exceptions outside the normal times we set. And then also note any bonus sessions. There, are, uh, Every single training, there are a couple bonus sessions uh, that occur that you can actually attend. And uh, we'll, we'll talk about those uh, from time to time uh, so you can schedule them in your calendar as well. Now, to prepare for your training session so that during orientation week you can do some preparation for these training sessions, listen to the appropriate CDs. That's the most important preparation you can do is just listen to the CDs I tell you to listen to during orientation week. Print and bring all your materials to that training session. So you got to prepare that sometimes, especially if you don't have your physical materials yet. Uh, test your phone or Skype or any phone system. Get a calling solution if needed. Remember, we are having these calls on, co on a conference line with a U.S. number. So if you're uh, out of the country or you're in a different continent or whatever, you don't have long distance, you got to get a solution for that. It's your responsibility. I don't pay for your uh, phone bills. And uh, so if you've got like AT&T and they're going to charge you $4 a minute, you know, um, you, you need to get a phone solution so you can afford to have these calls because they're pretty, they can be lengthy sometimes depending on the training you, that you're in. So Skype is a great solution. They usually have very competitive, if not the best rates. Now, of course, the challenge with Skype is that it is on uh, internet, so it's only as good as your internet connection. Sometimes we'll have people call in from Skype from a, a certain location and they either can't even get on the conference line or we can't hear them on the conference line. So just be aware that those could be challenges and you might want to test your specific Skype if you're going to be using Skype. What I suggest for Skype is if you're going to use it, you need a backup. You better have a backup. So have a really reasonably priced backup, even if it's a landline. If you're not in the US, you should be able to get a calling card or something that is fairly reasonable so that you got it just in case Skype's not working that day and then you can refill that card later if you need to. Um, so Skype needs a backup, let's put it that way. 
Uh, Skype is great. Sometimes it's better than a phone line. Sometimes it's a lot worse and it's just not suitable. Uh, so just be prepared for that if you're using Skype. Um, also, sometimes Skype just has trouble reaching the line, and so you got to call in multiple times. You got to call in early. So there are challenges that occur with Skype. I think Skype is great, and just be prepared for any contingency that happens with Skype. Test your phone line. Sometimes certain phone lines cannot call our, our our conference line in the U.S. for whatever reason. You may need to talk to your phone service about that. Bottom line is test it. Make sure it works. If it works, great. And then just make sure that your long distance bill isn't going to be crazy uh, in order to. Uh, uh, make those calls if that's going to be what you're going to do. Um, there are other calling solutions. There's, I know that there's something called Magic Jack out there that some people uh, have been using that seems to work okay. It's still an internet solution, so it's somewhat similar to Skype. So just be prepared for any issues around that as well. Um, and there are many other phone solutions as well. If you're going to use like a computer or a headset or or like a, a cell phone or something that is not your normal ordinary handset, remember you could create disruptions on the call because a speaker can feed back into a microphone and all of a sudden now we're getting an echo and then we'll have to mute you out. You'll have to mute yourself out. Um, that That's okay because if you need to speak up then you can always take yourself off of mute, but the best solution is one where you've got either a headset or you've got a, a really good phone line that uh, you've got a headset on where there's not going to be any kind of feedback. Cell phones can work on conference lines. They're not ideal. Generally speaking, they're a little bit more reliable than Skype, um, uh, and uh, but, but the quality is generally not as good as uh, just about any of the other solutions. Uh, if you're going to be mobile when you're on these calls, just realize that you know there could be issues there uh, as well. So be prepared for that. So test your phone, get a calling solution if needed to make sure you can afford these calls and that you can make them and actually hear everybody. Everybody can hear you. Okay, let's move on to the coaching team now. The coaching team scheduling, coaching team calls. So with your coaching team, you got to go to the roster and find them on the roster. I've sent you the links to the roster, I'm sure, probably by now. If not, you'll get them soon. Um, the roster is updated on a regular basis. So just go to that roster, and you'll, you'll find them. You'll find the coaching team on your roster. Um, generally, I try to get this labeled pretty clearly, and we explain how to find the coaching team in the call. But let me, get, let me just show you. We'll get out of this uh, presentation for a second. Let me just show you how to find uh, your coaching team on the current model of the roster. This roster may have changed a bit since uh, since uh, you actually uh, enrolled, but let me let me give you a sense of what that looks like. So we're just going to go to uh, the internet here, and I'm going to go to the current URL for the roster. So our current roster is tinyurl.com forward slash coach roster 2012. If you're enrolled in 2013 or something like that, you might have a different URL, so just find that. I, I'm sure I, I will send it to you, and you'll you'll hit a roster that looks something like this. Okay. Now the basics of this roster are that you'll see you your name over on the left hand side somewhere. You'll see your contact information, and then if you keep scrolling over to the right, you'll see the members of your coaching team. That's going to be the first group that you're going to see. Now, in order to know who's on your specific coaching team, you've got to find your name. So let's say I'm Allison, uh, and so I, I see this is my column or this is my row, right? So I got to go over to my row and look over here under coaching team, and I see my row has Alan, William, Melissa, Clara, and Mariana on the coaching team. Now, notice the borders and the members of the coaching team. There's a particular column that this is in that there's borders for. So watch the borders. That's how you know who's on a coaching team and who's not on the coaching team. Uh, there, we have a maximum of five at this point. You might have a minimum of about three, depending on where we've gone with this. But that's basically how to find the names of the members of the coaching team. Once you got their names, you just find their contact information by finding their name over here on the left-hand side and then looking for their contact information. So hopefully that's pretty straightforward. You should be able to do that yourself without uh, too much trouble. So let's go ahead and continue now that we've taken a look at the roster for the coaching team specifically. Note their contact information. So you probably pull that off of the roster and just go ahead and put that in your contextual information in a file somewhere. Contact them for, to schedule. I, I 
recommend that you email them, but also call them as well, because email sometimes people just forget about it, or they ignore it or something like that. So call them. And then schedule, when you call them, you're going to schedule the week one sessions. Those are usually around an hour. And the week one sessions will include, you know, or session number one of the week one sessions will be you coaching them. Session number two of the week one sessions will be they coach you. So there's actually two sessions you're scheduling with each member of the coaching team in week one. Two sessions, not one. And the reason there's two is because you're going to coach them and then they coach you. Okay, now you can schedule these at the same time and schedule a big block, right? A couple hours, let's say. Or you can schedule different times depending on how you guys want to break up the time, what's your at your mutual convenience. So your coaching team, that's what you need to schedule for the first week. Two sessions, one they coach you, one you coach them. And that'll be phone sessions, about an hour usually for the first session. And also, if you want to, if they want to, you can schedule some get to know you time during orientation week. That's really optional. So what are we doing again? You're finding them on the roster, contacting them to schedule two sessions in week one. You coach them, they coach you. Maybe set some get to know you time. That's it. That's what you're going to do to schedule them. Now, to prepare for those sessions in week one, you want to do this during orientation week, hopefully, if not early in week one, <clears throat> you're going to find your call syntax. That call syntax is going to be in your operations manual. Now, I'm going to not going to tell you the page because this isn't specific for a specific training, but your call syntax will be in your operations manual, and it'll say something like, uh, you know, your your call or call syntax or accountability coaching call or something like that. Uh, so find that, and again, I'll help you locate that uh, during orientation week. And you might want to make a copy of it or. I don't know, print it out or something, put it in a file for your coaching team calls specifically because that syntax is the syntax you must use for each of those coaching calls. Find the coach quality and performance evaluations. And then there are three of these. There's an accountability coach quality and performance evaluation. There's a strategy quality and performance evaluation. There's an assessment quality and performance evaluation. So find that coach quality and performance evaluation for each one of those uh, areas. Now, you might say, well, Jeff, I'm a strategy coach, so you know I don't need the other ones. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. Because what these are for is not for you and your coaching. They're for your coaches and their coaching. So when your coaches coach you, you're going to use these evaluation forms to guide you in your scoring of their coaching sessions. So again, accountability, strategy, and assessment, you need one of each. Uh, in most of the manuals, we've got at least accountability and strategy assessments, a newer area, so you may need to search for it online, but it's pretty easy to find those. Download them, print them out, get them in front of you. They're also on your quick reference cards, but you must have those available and, and have them ready and prepared for, for these coaching team calls when they coach you, not necessarily when you coach them. Now, when you coach them, you need to let them know, hey, I'm a strategy coach, so please use the strategy coach quality and performance evaluation to score me. You may even want to give them some guidance on what those scoring elements mean uh, before they actually score you based upon what you've learned already. So hopefully that makes sense. But you got to get that call syntax. You got to get those evaluations because that stuff is really crucial for your sessions that you're going to do. And then review how to score. The how to score guide is on your CDs and also in your workbook. So in the CDs, I talk about how to score. And then the workbook, I discuss it in, in print. I believe in your workbook and your logistics tab in your workbook. And it, the, the page varies depending on your uh, training as well. So that's a little bit of what to do to prepare. And here's what you're going to do in your first sessions with your coaching team. You might want to write this down. You're going to get to know them. Especially if you didn't have that get to know you time in orientation week, maybe take some extra time to get to know them. You're going to get their goals. No matter what kind of coach you are, you want to get their goals. Find out at least what their top three goals are for at least the next eight weeks, if not for the next six months and, their, and the next year. Get their goals. Hopefully that's clear. And then don't stop there. This isn't just a get to know you call in week one. You're going to follow the normal coaching syntax. Remember the one that I just told you that you're going to need to get from the operations manual? You're going to use that syntax. So even though the first call is a special call and you're going to take some extra time to get to know them and some extra time to get their goals, that's totally extra apart from the normal coaching call you're about to do. You also are going to do a no normal coaching call 
So don't get the misconception that like, oh, it's week one, so we really don't coach. No, you're coaching, and you're going to get a score, and they're going to they and they got to coach you, and they got to get a score. And you're going to hit the ground running, okay? So follow the normal syntax once you've gotten to know them, once you've gotten their goals. Follow the normal syntax, uh, and uh, and complete a fully complete call. That fully complete call, if you're an accountability strategy coach, might take somewhere between 45 minutes or more. Uh, as an assessment coach, might take even a little bit more time than that. And then whatever time you've got left, you can get scored by your coachee, by your client, basically, and write that score down. And then you're done. You schedule the next session, and you're in great shape. After the session, and I just already mentioned this, I'm getting ahead of myself, uh, you're going to share or get the score, depending on if you're the coach or the client. You know, obviously, if you're the client, you're going to score them. They're the client, they score you, and you get the score. Use the proper evaluation sheet. I've said that about 30 times. <laughs> uh, and then give and receive feedback and suggestions for improvement. So if you've been coaching them, then, hey, the tables turn a little bit. Now they can give you some feedback on how you did. And if you were a crappy coach, they're going to let you know. And they're going to let you know why. They're going to let you know what you can do differently the next time. Because this is what it's all about. It's not about being a perfect coach the first session. It's about getting better and better and better because you've got clients that are telling you what you could do to get better as well. So they'll score you, but then also they'll justify that score with an explanation, hopefully also give you feedback based upon the score and how, they, how you can score better next time. By the way, make sure you reciprocate for them. If they're coaching you and you give them a crappy score, tell them why. Tell them what happened. Tell them what didn't work. Tell them what could have worked better. Tell them what they need to do next time for you to score them better based upon what you'd like as a client. You know? Now again, you want to be honest and you want to be clear about what you're scoring them. And don't just score them arbitrarily just because you didn't feel good about the session necessarily. But if you have a score in that uh, particular evaluation sheet that is specific to the issue that you've got that didn't work or something like that, then okay, give them an appropriate score. That's fair. Right? But like if you've got an accountability coach and you just hate your accountability coach, uh, but you got, but it was a good session, and it like it paid off for you, and you you know you're gonna follow through. Well, there's no likability score in the accountability evaluation sheet. So yeah, you might tell them, hey, I really hate your guts right now, but you got really good scores, and that's you know th that's just mature. That's just being uh, honest and 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 taking care of business in terms of what the actual scoring sheet is saying. So don't let your own subjective opinion, don't let your own um, ideas about what you feel like getting as a client or what you feel like they should do as a coach um, get in the way of giving the scores uh, based upon the way the scores are dictating. Let the scores dictate how you're going to score. If you do that, you're going to be serving your coach in the highest and best way possible. So make sure you do that after the session occurs. Right after the session, don't finish the session without scoring them. Remember, you'll have two sessions with each member of your coaching team every week of the eight-week immersion training. Two sessions. They coach you, you coach them. One where you coach them, one where they coach you. I think we've said it about you know 50 times at this point. And get a score after every session, or that session's not complete. If you leave a session, Without getting the score, you didn't do a session because you can't report that you did the session. As far as I'm concerned, as far as the staff is concerned, no, no session happened. You just had a conversation, basically. So make sure you make time for that ever, after every session. And if you don't have time, then make sure you schedule a time immediately as close as possible to that session to get your score. Because if you don't get your score, it's on you. You're going to have to reschedule that session, do a whole other session, especially if your client uh, doesn't remember uh, the session and can't really give you a, a score uh, based upon something that might be accurate. So that's your coaching team. Hopefully that all makes sense. Your coaching partner. So with your coaching partner, again, you, what do you do? Find them on the roster, just like we talked about before. So let's go to the roster really briefly. Take another look. Go back to this roster. Again, we've got the members of the coaching team. And then right next to that, to the right, is your coaching partner. So you just find your name, you go across to your coaching partner, and then you find their name. Once you've got their name, you go all the way back here to the left, find their name on the left, 
find their contact information, and rock and roll. That is step one for your coaching partner. Find them on the roster. Next, note their contact information, copy it down somewhere, contact them to schedule a session on Monday of week one. That's on Monday, not on a Tuesday, not on a Wednesday, not sometime that week. It's on Monday. That's week that is week one, day one of your like your sixty day experience here. And the game is that you know the first day you're doing a session with them and I would suggest you schedule about 30 60 minutes because there's probably gonna be some extra get to know you time in there uh, you don't have to do that but it, it's it's recommended so to prepare for that coaching partner session find the syntax and the syntax is gonna be titled instructions for the coaching partner call uh, you'll find that in your quick reference cards and also in your workbook as well um, under the logistics tab I believe I believe it's the last page in the logistics tab uh, although that could have changed uh, so find that syntax it's just a one page syntax pretty simple stuff use the syntax at least for the first week use that syntax for the first week after that you can start to optimize that for your own purposes now remember you need to schedule daily sessions with your coaching partner for the entire eight weeks the entire eight week immersion training daily sessions um, if you want to take like weekends off or maybe one day a week that you just you know give it a rest oh, that's okay but I you know best is seven days a week second best is five or six days a week um, make sure you schedule those daily with them sessions will get shorter as you master the process so eventually they'll get about five to ten minutes uh, sessions sometimes maybe they get along because there's some issue that has to be handled uh, or something to talk about but um, after the first couple sessions, you get used to the syntax. You've gotten to know each other. You get comfortable. Five to ten minutes. Five, like I usually say, hey, it's going to be about five minutes. I'll take five minutes and coach you a little bit. You take five minutes, coach me, and we get off the phone. We know when we're going to session or when we're going to schedule our next session. When we're going to session our next schedule, that would be mixed up. So anyway, those sessions will get shorter. So after the first couple days, expect that. And don't worry if you guys are taking all this extra time the first couple days of the training. Eh, you know, that'll happen just to get uh, to know them. Moving on to the mentor. Moving on to the mentor. So, you know, new students, you're going to be assigned a one on one mentor. It's going to work with you on a weekly basis to guide you through the training. Senior students, anybody, if you've, or if you're a student and you're going on your second or third immersion training, mentoring is available on an as needed basis over email or phone. Uh, so let's talk new students. So if you're a new student, find your mentor on the roster. I already showed you the roster a couple times. I'm not going to belabor that. Right next to your coaching partner will be uh, a label that says mentor. There's going to be a column that says mentor and just find their name and find them on the roster. If you go below, um, you find, you'll find them. Uh, all the mentor's contact information will be on the bottom of the roster. And then contact them to set the first session in week one. Optional, you can do some get to know you uh, call uh, during your orientation week as well, but at least that first session has got to be in week one. It's pretty simple stuff. Now, remember, you'll have weekly sessions with your mentor for the entire immersion training. Email contact is optional if needed. Sometimes it's a great way to stay accountable or, or uh, ask questions of your mentor, something like that, and that's fine. Now, what are you going to do with your mentor? I mean, you got all these other coaches. What, what are you going to use your mentor for? Use them for your guide through the eight-week immersion training. So they're your, really your only one-on-one -on -one coach slash mentor that, uh, that knows everything there is to know about the training already, that's been through all of it and mastered it. That's why they're your mentor. That's why I hired them to do this with you. Okay, so they're really your ultimate guide. For the training now you might get information from your partner your team and other places but they are really you almost always good they're going to tell you the gospel so they're going to tell you the real deal about the immersion training about what's going on you can use them for clarity support advice etc also use them as another coach i mean they're a great coach they're they're really a master coach and they can help you in any area of your life or your business. So you can definitely use them for that as well. And then finally, use them for a chance to coach and get scores and feedback from a master coach. So, and, and let me make sure I'm clear about this. 
you know, because one of the things that uh, students have really asked for a lot is a lot more feedback and a lot of, uh, you know, chances to coach master coaches and get feedback from them. And, you know, this is always available. I just never really suggested it until now. And so I'm going to make a suggestion that if you were working with your mentor one on one, then great. Coach, is, talk to your mentor and say, hey, next week, uh, can I coach you uh, for a couple weeks? I'd like to coach you and I'd like to get a score from you and I'd like to um, get feedback from you on what I can do better. And uh, then maybe I'll coach you the following week and I'll do the same thing. And I'll hopefully I'll improve. I'll get some better scores from you and I'll get some additional feedback. Now, again, I don't recommend you do this every single time. But, I mean, these guys are masters. I mean, they do this all the time. They know how to get those, how to get great scores. They know what it takes. They've gone through that themselves. They know what to listen for and what you're doing uh, right and wrong, so to speak. I hate to say right and wrong, but they do. They do. They know what you're doing wrong and they know what you're doing right. And so they'll tell you. And they won't pull punches. Maybe like some of your coaching team might, you know, just because they're trying to get you to give them a good score too. These guys don't care about that. They're, they're just going to tell you the truth. Um, and they're going to tell you the truth in a way that's more, probably more sophisticated, more detailed, and uh, with a higher level of understanding of that specific type of coaching than maybe just about anybody else you're going to get feedback from throughout that eight-week immersion training. So you use them as a chance to get those scores and feedback from a real master coach. They, every single mentor is a master coach. And that's the only reason. I mean, I've got a lot of coaches that work for me, but I only have like two or three uh, master coaches that I allow to mentor other coaches in uh, the eight-week immersion training. So use them for this if uh, you feel that that would be valuable and if you really want that too. It will definitely help you improve. So the point is you just got to go through each of these four areas that we just talked about and just check them off your list. Okay, I, did I schedule my training sessions? Did I schedule my coaching team members for two sessions? Uh, did I prepare for those? Did I schedule my coaching partner to prepare for those? Did I schedule my mentor? You know, what, did I do all this? You know, so just check these off. Okay, so that's scheduling and preparing for your calls. That was really the big part of this. The rest of this is a little bit easier. So let's talk about attending orientation and preliminary training sessions. So attend your orientation call and preliminary training sessions. These are both calls. So let's talk orientation. Orientation will be recorded. This is the general orientation call. It covers everything that's in this video and more. And there's also time for Q&A on the call. So if you got a question from this video, then great, ask me on that call. Okay, now let's talk about preliminary training sessions. You must attend this training session. This is not optional. We'll schedule your ongoing training sessions during this prelim call. Make sure you write those down. You're available to help do that. More specific information about your training will be provided during, uh, during this preliminary session. And we'll also have some preparation for training session number one as well. So we'll do all that in the prelim session. This is really an action-packed session right here. Um, now, scheduling your ongoing training sessions, that's really the one of the number one reasons why you need to be at that pre prelim session. Because if you're not there, we're going to schedule them at a time that you can't make. Now, I, I don't mean we're going to hope for that or we're going to be like, okay, they're not there. Let's schedule it when they can't make it. But there's a good chance that we'll do that and then all of a sudden you're shot like you're gonna have to change your whole schedule or it'll be very upsetting or you won't be able to make some of the calls and then you're not going to complete your training that's the bottom line so you got to make that first session more specific information every single training has different things that happen different materials that are needed so you will get more specific information that I won't waste time on in the general orientation because everybody's there from different trainings and then of course we'll be preparing or prepping, per perping, I don't know what that is, but uh, per we'll be prepping for training session number one as well. Okay, so now let's move on to listening to your first CDs. Listening to your first CDs. Now, uh, very simply, watch your email and listen closely during orientation calls, and I'll let you know which CDs to listen to. Now, very simply put uh, as well, even if you didn't know, you could just listen to like your first two or three CDs and you're probably in pretty good shape uh, or you're close to pretty good shape. So just listen to what that is, make a note, and make sure you listen to those during orientation week. Okay, 
Let's go ahead and move on now to read and access your materials. Read and access your materials. So this is real important. I mean, this, it, we talked a lot about scheduling, and scheduling is a big part of this because that's the kind of the non-educational side. It's the kind that's the side where you're really just experiencing, learning, getting coaching, and practicing what you're learning. But your materials are really a, a huge part of where you get a lot of your information, a lot of your training, a lot of your um, uh, knowledge that you're going to leverage in real world scenarios. So this is pretty important to look at. So um, if you received your materials in the mail, then just read your manual. Just read it. You don't have to read it word for word, but just at least skim through it uh, as much of it as possible. Just flip page by page by page. It'll take like a half hour or a little bit more. Um, read the stuff that looks like about logistics and things like that, especially read through a lot of your workbook. Um, and, uh, and it's really going to help you get a sense of exactly what's going on in your materials and where to find things. Look through your quick reference cards. Read any additional guides and addendums that you might get uh, in, in the mail. And then check your CDs. Make sure you got all your CDs. If you don't, email us. If you don't have any of this, any, any of these things you're not receiving, uh, you know, let us know. So uh, I'm aware of uh, any mistakes that my staff might have made. Uh, browse your iPad or your iPod, that is. It would be great if you got an iPad. Uh, browse your iPod. Um, and make sure you got uh, access to the audios that are on your iPod and then check your and load your CD-ROMs. Your CD-ROMs are usually packaged with your CDs. They're just different color and there's only one or two of those usually. And pop them into your computer and load all the information onto your computer. Usually what I would suggest is take your CD-ROM, pop it into your computer and then pull all the data off of it onto your computer. Okay? Then if you scratch up your CD-ROM, you don't have a problem. Uh, because at least the data is safe on your computer. It's backed up, so to speak. Uh, you don't have to do that. You could just use a CD-ROM the whole time, but that's not the safest way to uh, load up all your materials that you need. So load your CD-ROMs, review them, make sure you can find everything in your CD-ROMs. Now, if you're using virtual materials during the training, even if it's just at first because you don't have your materials yet, find your login link. We'll have sent the link to you. Find your username and password. We'll have sent that to you as well. If not, just email us then hey log in first thing to do when you log in is download your manuals you want to find the manuals area in the, the members area and just download those they're quite large files but download them to your computer print them out read them if you don't want to print them you can read them on your computer or your iPad or something but uh, it, you, you at least got to download them so you got access to them download your CDs or just locate them just find them uh, uh, what I mean by that is uh, you may not have to you may, may not want to download them to your computer but you can um, and then if you just locate them then you could probably stream them from the computer as well if you choose to do that so at least locate where those CDs are located on the virtual materials gateway and then finally browse download support materials for your first assignment sheet so the assignment sheets will usually be um, notated pretty clearly in the uh, the virtual materials gateway and so just go to the sheet one area and then just l browse through which assignments have support materials because not all assignments will you won't find and this is a big misconception a lot of students think well I'll just go online I'll go to my where where these assignment like materials are and I'll get my assignments and that's not how it works your assignments are located in your workbook let me say that again. Your assignments are located in your workbook. In your workbook. That's where your assignments are. They're not on your iPod. They're not on your CD-ROM. They're not in, in your virtual uh, uh, support materials for assignment sheets. They're in your workbook. So you must have that workbook downloaded and read through the workbook in order to find your assignment sheet, one, two, three, etc. However, some assignments have audios, videos, PDF documents and other things associated with them. And those are not located in your workbook. So those are located in your CD-ROM, they're located in your iPod, they're located online if you don't have a CD-ROM or iPod sent to you yet. And you can go online, browse and download support materials for a specific assignment sheet. So if you go to assignment sheet one, is those, are those your assignments? No. 
but they're all the materials that you need to download or play or watch or listen to that are associated with assignment sheet one. Hopefully that makes sense. If it doesn't, ask me during uh, an orientation call or email me and I'll try and clarify that even more. So that's what to do if you've got virtual materials. So we've talked about reading and accessing your materials. Now let's talk about record and store key info. Record and store key info. So you want to record and store the contact info for other students. Of course, you're getting that from the roster, your mentor, staff, just anybody that you know you need to contact. Just get their info down in some kind of contact card or something so you, you know everybody that you can call. It, the worst thing you can do is go through this training alone. Some coaches are loners. Some coaches are like they're real creative people, but they're not really big at on talking to everybody, right? Um, if that's you, overcome that during at least the next eight weeks so you can get help because you can't survive this training alone. You know, it's it's set up such that you must access your mentor, your stu the students that are in the training, staff, etc. So you're in a conversation because that's where you'll learn the most. Okay, so make sure that you got that contact information. Also, make sure that you record and store the links and the login info because you know you you need that throughout the eight weeks. You don't want to lose that stuff. It's been emailed to you probably, and then record and store the dates and times for all calls, etc. We already talked about that. And then finally, record and store the guides and syntaxes for the calls. Now, although these are, yes, they're, they're in your quick reference cards, they're in your uh, manuals, especially if you have virtual materials, you got to want to print out these specifically. All the guides and syntaxes for specific calls. Remember, you've got a guide for or syntax for your team, your coaching team calls, or your weekly calls. You've got a guide and syntax for your daily partner calls. So you print out those two uh, pages, print out those two pieces of paper. Uh, get them in front of you and keep them in the right file. Real important to, to have those uh, available to you. And then any other guide for anything else, any other calls that you're doing, just so you've got that. And you know you're really doing a good job on those calls and you're not just winging it and doing whatever you feel like doing. Also, um, you want to make sure you're recording uh, your own stuff. And I suggest you get a hardbound journal for this type of stuff. Uh, so go to Borders, go oh, Borders is out of business. Go to go to Barnes and Noble, go to Amazon, and uh, order a journal if you don't have a journal. And make sure it's hardbound. Make sure it's something that's like something you would be willing to put in a bookshelf someday in your bookcase. I mean, something really nice. It's going to be like a twenty-dollar journal, right? Doesn't have to be huge, but it's got to be something that really w won't be lost. It's not just like a legal pad, right? And get that in front of you, and then record things like notes insights, assignments, and work that you're doing around assignments, record that stuff in that hardbound journals, uh, journal. Record commitments. If you're doing coaching calls, every coaching call it could be another page in your hardbound journal. You know, you could really fill a journal with, with really valuable uh, notes from this training, this eight-week training. So one of the things I learned from Jim Rohn, great personal development speaker, uh, is keeping journals. And one of the things that Jim Rohn said is, you know, a lot of people don't want to buy a real expensive hardbound journal, like a $30 journal, a $25 journal, $50 journal. He said, you know, what I would always do is I'd pay a lot for the journal, and then my job was figuring out how to fill that journal with 10 times the value in terms of the information I put in that journal. And he said, well, you know, if I just write the, you know, really, really valuable stuff on every page of my journal, it's going to be real easy to more than pay for that journal. So it's amazing how little value some people put on the notes they take or on the, the thoughts they have or on the, the, you know, what, like just the internal workings that they need to get on paper that really could help them. And maybe one of the reasons they put low value on it is because it's not valuable thoughts and and so having a really valuable journal can sometimes can be motivating to say okay you know what I got this $50 journal maybe I should start thinking more valuable thoughts and, and really intelligent stuff and write it down and that'll be worth it so it could be motivating just from that perspective and if you do already have valuable thoughts then putting in a valuable journal is appropriate it's also going to make it so you tend to value those thoughts even more 
and at least you got a place you'll be able to find those thoughts. So store this type of stuff in a journal. So that's what to do during orientation week. Again, we've covered all of this good stuff, the purpose of orientation week, what happens on orientation week, and what you should do during orientation week. So that's your guide to getting started in the eight-week immersion training, your guide to orientation week. If you got any questions about this, feel free to email me or call. Uh, feel free to bring it up on an orientation call or a preliminary call or your first training call if you just listened to this. Bring it up with your mentor uh, as well. But I hope this really helps you kind of organize all this in your head and get much more clear on exactly what to do during orientation week and how orientation week is supposed to fit in to the rest of your eight-week immersion training. So good luck, uh, great coaching, and I look forward to uh, seeing you become a master coach in the next eight, eight and a half weeks. Take care until then.